afterwards. We said last week, the Apostle Paul, he gives us, he gives us various pieces of armor in, in Ephesians chapter 6, various pieces of armor that enable us to, to withstand the enemy. But you could also say it, there are various ways to withstand the enemy. If you understand it like that, it, it just it, it helps you. It's not just pieces of armor, but it's various ways that we can withstand. The Bible says, it says, therefore put on the full armor. So in other words, what it's saying is, it's saying use all of these ways. Don't just, don't just select one or, or the other, but if you use all of them, you're going to be able to stand. Therefore put on the full armor so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Now, some people are a little bit casual about the armor, and they've read about it. They know it's there somewhere, but, you know, as long as I'm saved. Listen, if God says, put on the full armor, use all of these ways, I think we'll be smart to use all of these ways and not, not to be casual about it. When, 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 when we have an attitude where we say, well, you know, I'm saved and that's what matters, it's almost like a soldier, a naked soldier, running around with a helmet of salvation because he's saved. It's all I need. I mean, how, how stupid can you be? So let's look this morning at the last one, at number six, the last piece of armor or the last way that we can stand against the, the devil. And I'm going to read from verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation and, here it is, the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, the sword of the Spirit differs from all the other pieces of armor in that the sword is both offensive and defensive. The other pieces of armor that we've looked at, all five of them are defensive. So you use them to protect yourself. You don't take your helmet off and clobber your enemy to death with a, with a helmet. You don't use it in a defensive way at all. It's... it's, it's uh, in, in an offensive way, you use it in a defensive way. The same with the shield. The same with the, with the, with the, the shield of faith, the breastplate of, of righteousness, and, and the sandals. You're not going to take your sandal off and go smack somebody with a sandal, all right? <laughs> and so these are, these are defensive pieces of, of armor, but the, the, the sword is different. The sword is, is both offensive and defensive. So in other words, you, you can use the sword to defend yourself, but you can certainly use the sword to drive the enemy back. The Bible tells us in James 4 verse 7, it tells us to resist the enemy and he will flee. Now notice it doesn't say when, when you come and when you resist, when you got your sword, uh, that he, he, yeah, he'll take a step back. You'll just back off a little bit. No, it says... He will flee. And another way to say it is, he will get the hell out of there. It's probably the only time you can use that expression from stage. All right. So, but he will get the hell out of there. Now, to illustrate that, I want us to quickly look at uh, a quick scene of the Lion King. Let me, let me quickly explain it. Uh, little Simba, this little, little cub, he's got his little sidekick, Nala, his little... Uh, a romantic interest. He's got her with him. And they leave the safety of the lion pride and they venture off into, into enemy territory right into the, the elephant graveyard. And it's then the elephant graveyard that they encounter three hyenas. Of course, the hyenas are their enemy. And so the hyenas give chase and they go after these two little cubs and the little cubs are are, are, are racing, going through the, the elephant graveyard until eventually they end up in a cave. But this is where they discover they've got their backs up against the wall and there's nowhere that they can go. And so in desperation, little Simba lets out a, a roar. But it's quite comical because, because it's more like a little growl. And, and so, of course, these hyenas, these three hyenas, they're looking at it and they're saying to him, is that it? That's the best you got? <laughs> now, unbeknownst to them, Simba's father, the king, the great lion, has slipped in the back of the cave. And they're totally unaware. And so as they start closing in on, on little Simba, 
he, he lets out another, he tries another roar. And the next moment they hear the most powerful, loudest roar, because it's the roar of the king. You want to see the clip? All right, let's not worry. You know, first service wanted to. All right. Let's watch it. Oh! Did we lose him? I think so. Where's Zazu? Ah! Oh, the major domo bird hippity hopped all the way to the birdie boiler. Oh no, not the birdie boiler! Ah! <laughs> hey, why don't you pick on somebody your own size? Like you? Oops. Ah! <gasps> If you ever come near my son again. Oh, this is this is your son. Oh, yours? <laughs> oh, did you know that? No, me? I, I didn't know. No, did you? No, of course not. No. Ed? <laughs> Toodles. That's what it means to get the hell out of there. And that's what happens when the king roars. Now. When these hyenas, when they looked at, uh, at um, the little cub, at little, little Simba, they saw this weak, puny little cub. But when the king roared, everything changed. Because you see, suddenly it put fear and terror into their hearts. And sometimes for you and me, we, we look at ourselves in relation to a problem, we see ourselves as weak and puny. We look at ourselves in relation to our, our enemy and what we're up against, and, 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 and we're weak and puny, and, and we don't have what it takes. But let me tell you, when the enemy roars on your behalf, everything changes, and that's where the enemy starts scattering. The Bible says in Psalm 68, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. My message to you today is simply this. This is what I want you to take home. There is, an, there, there is a God who wants to roar on your behalf. There is a God who wants to roar on your behalf. And the way that He does it is through this. Because this is His roar. This is His Word. And God is saying to you and me, He says, I want you to get into the Word. And I want, you, I want for the Word to get into you so that you can start quoting it, that you can start declaring it, because I want to roar on your behalf. You see, friends, this is not just a book. This is the book. This is the living, eternal, infallible, inerrant, indestructible Word of God. This is the greatest book that was ever written. Do you know that more copies of this book has been sold than any other book in history? And God says, I want you to get into it now. Throughout the ages, Satan has tried to attack this book. And he's lied about this book. And he's got Christians to be casual about this book. It's not, it's not really necessary to read it. You can let it lie next to the side of your bed. As long as you come to church on a Sunday, you can just let it lie. What, what is he doing? He's getting us to be casual about the book. He also tries to get, get Christians to question the book. Or to doubt God's Word. And, and, and that's nothing new because that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. All the way back he comes to, to Eve and he says to Eve, Did God really say that? Did, did God really? What is he doing? He's trying to get her 
to doubt God's word. He's trying to get you and me to doubt his word. Why? Because then we don't use his word against him. And because he's defenseless against God's word. Do you know that Satan has tried to destroy the word of God right throughout the ages? If it wasn't communism, then it was the next thing or the next. You can go all the way back in history, all the way back to the Roman Empire. The Roman emperor, Diocletian, he passes an edict that, that all Bibles have to be burned. And so what happened? They, just, they were burning Bibles left, right, and center, and eventually even slaughtering Christians be, because of this. And so eventually he, you know, he thinks he's, 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 he's uh, celebrating his victory and everything over this Jesus, and, and he erects a, a monument over some burnt Bibles. He erects this monument, and he puts on a plaque that says the name of Jesus Christ has, has, has been erased from the face of the earth. But he puts a plaque on there. I mean, how foolish, how stupid. And, and he doesn't even realize that out of, out of the, the ashes of those burnt Bibles would explode a worldwide revival that would establish Christianity. And it would grow and it would just start thriving and taking off right up until today. What a fool. Anybody who tries to destroy God's Word is, is foolish. And anybody who's casual about God's Word is really is foolish. But you see, we've got to realize behind Diocletian was Satan himself. Remember we said very often Satan uses people to fulfill his plans and his purposes. He uses people like, like pawns and, 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 and he moves them. And this is exactly what he did with a communist government. This is what, he's, what he did back there with, with Diocletian. And the reason he did that, the reason he wanted to try and remove the Bible is because he cannot stand the roar of the king. He's got to flee. So let's make this practical this morning. How do we use the sword of the Spirit? Because Paul tells us this is one of our most powerful weapons. He's given us, he's given us some armor, but now he gives us a weapon. And now how do we use that? And I want to make it practical. And there are three steps quickly. And here they are. Dig in, discover and declare. You've got to dig in, then discover and declare. So let's, let's quickly have a look at that first one. Dig in. What does it mean to dig in? Well, let me just say to you, some people think because they have a Bible, they have power. Do you know that you can have a dozen Bibles at home and have no power? Do you know that you can put up Scripture all over your home, at the front door, all the way through to the bathroom? You'll have no power. Some Christians think they do that. Put up scriptures all over. It's going to fend off the evil powers or something like some, some kind of spiritual voodoo or something. <laughs> Listen, you've got to dig into the Word. You can't just stick it up all over. You've got, to, you've got to get into that. You see, God is saying to you and me, you've got to get into it so that it can get into you. You've got to get into it so that it can get into you. Daniel chapter 11 says the people who know their God will be strong and do exploits. Not the people who own a Bible or the people who own 12 Bibles or the people who have scriptures all over around their homes, but the people who know their God. Now, how do we get to know somebody? You've got to spend time with them. How do we get to know God? Very similar. You've got to spend time in His Word. And when you and I spend time in His Word, guess what happens? We get, we get to know Him. We get to know His, his preferences and His promises and, 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 and His power. Where did it start? We just, we just started digging in. You see, when you start digging into the Word, you start discovering. So let's go to number two then, to discover. When you dig in, you're going to discover. In Joshua 1 verse 8 it says, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it. What does that sound like? Digging in. <laughs> you shall dig into it day and night, 
that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Can we read it again? This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate. You shall dig into it that you may observe to do. What does that mean? That you may do what it tells you to do. So when, when you dig into it, you're going to eventually start doing. But what happens in between? What happens between digging into God's Word and, and doing there's a discovering. There's a discovering. And so this is what it looks like. You dig into God's Word, and you start discovering the truths in God's Word, and you start doing, or you start living according to God's Word. But now notice, it doesn't say, you know, uh, dig into God's Word occasionally. You know, meditate on it every now and again when, when you've got a little bit of time. You know, when, when the wife fires off, you have nothing else to do, and it kind of fits into your schedule, then maybe get into God's Word. It doesn't say that. But it tells us to meditate on His Word day and night. What, what does that mean? It means daily. Daily. You've got to get into God's Word. In other words, it means make it a priority. That's all. Make God's Word a priority. Now, if I had to ask you this morning, what is a greater priority in your home? Wi-Fi or God's Word? Don't answer that. All right. Make it a priority. Now, what does it mean to meditate? It says meditate on, on God's Word. Dig, dig into God's Word. Uh, le let, me, let me first quickly explain this. The, the Word of God... Uh, is described by two words in Scripture in the original language, Logos and Rhema. Logos is the written Word of God. You could say it's the general Word of God. Rhema is when that general Word becomes a specific Word. When God highlights or enlightens the general Word and it becomes a specific Word, that's when it becomes Rhema. Now, to meditate on God's Word, or the reason we meditate, is not because I just want to read the Logos quickly. It's because I want to, I want to read the Logos, I want, to, I want to meditate on it a little bit, I want to think about it, maybe during the day even let my thoughts just go to that, that, that verse or that scripture, and guess what happens? The next moment, it's almost as if it, it pops out. It, 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 it becomes yours, it, it becomes uh, real, it becomes rhema. That's why the Bible tells us to, to meditate. It doesn't tell us to quickly read. That's one of the, re one of the things I have against these, these reading Bible reading programs where you, where you go through like a couple of chapters a day. Yes, you'll get through the Bible in a couple of months' time. But man, you're going through it in such a fast rate that you don't get to meditate on it. And, 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 and you don't actually get the, the rhema out of that. Now, somebody who doesn't spend time in God's Word, well, what happens to them? They, they end up following uh, his opinion and her opinion and my own opinion. And I end up following, you know, I think what's acceptable in society. You know, everybody's doing this. I guess, I, I guess it's okay. You know, we kind of do that. But the, you see, here's the problem. What's acceptable in society today is often in stark contrast to what's acceptable here in God's Word. And when you and I find ourselves living according to society, according to what's acceptable, according to what, well, everybody else is, is doing that, we find ourselves in trouble, be it financially, be it relationally, be it even, even health-wise. Uh, spiritually, we, we find ourselves in trouble. But when we follow God's Word, guess what happens? We find ourselves blessed and prosperous and successful because that's what the Scripture says. It says, for then, when you've done what? When, when you dig in and you discover and you start doing. 
Dig in, discover, start doing. Dig in, discover, start doing. Then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So that's just the natural outflow from, from spending time in God's Word. Now, Colossians 3 verse 16 says, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. When God's Word dwells in us, the enemy can't mess with us. Because, because we, got, we got the raw of the king on the inside. But on the other hand, if there's very little of God's word on the inside, you, you're like easy prey to the enemy. When, when, you, when you are quite comfortable to come to a 30-minute, uh, you know, listen to 30 minutes of God's word, yeah, on a Sunday, but you don't get into God's word during the week, you're easy prey to the enemy. But when you get to the place where you start opening God's Word every single morning, and you spend some time in God's Word, and you just start meditating on it, what are you doing? You're digging in, and you're discovering God's Word. Guess what happens? You become the enemy's worst nightmare. And so when, when, I, when I open my Bible in the morning, I just come before the Lord, and I just say, God, speak to me. God, may, may the Logos here on this page become rhema in my heart. God, may, may, may the words on the page become your words in my heart because I can't face this battle out there on my own. My, my little growl is not going to make it. I need the roar of the king. And when you and I get into God's word like that, something happens and and. and and, and, and the Logos becomes Rhema. You start reading a, a whole passage, and next moment, one line, one scripture just stands out, and you know that's God speaking to me. I, I needed that. Now, let's make this even more practical. Let's move on to the next step, and this is to declare. So it's dig in, discover, and then, and then declare. Psalm, 61, uh, Psalm 68 verse 1 says, Let God arise, let God arise, let His enemies be scattered. Can I ask you, how do we let God arise? Let His, let His Word arise. So when you and I start declaring God's Word, that's when God arises. So let's say, let's say you open your Bible and you start reading first thing in the morning, just in your quiet time, and you happen to be reading in, in Philippians chapter 4, and you're reading along, and you, and you get to verse 19, and it says, my God shall supply all of my needs according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And you go like, wow, because you, you happen to be going through a tough time financially, and, and, and it's, going, it's going a bit tough at work, and you're like, wow. Now, only a fool says, wow, and closes that, and a half an hour later, they've forgotten what they've read. They, 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 just, they just move on. They, they go through the day. And guess what happens? The enemy keeps you in poverty. Because remember, he wants to destroy your life. And, and not just spiritually, because we think He wants to destroy us spiritually. He will, he will destroy every area of your life. He wants to destroy you physically, attack your physical body, your health. He wants to, he wants to attack your relationships. He wants to attack your, your, your finances. And so what happens? He puts poverty on you. And unless you use the sword of the Spirit, unless you start fighting back, unless you use the, 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 the roar of the king, he's going to keep you in poverty. But you see, if you're smart and you read that scripture, you look at that and you go like, wow, that's Rhema. Logos has just become Rhema. I needed that. And, you see, and, and before you even go out, you close your eyes and you say, God, your word says that you will supply all of my needs. And by the way, I've plenty of needs, by the way, you know. All of my needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Guess what's just happened? The king has just roared. 
on your behalf. And the enemy has got to scatter. Those, those hyenas are running out the cave already. Poverty has just started running. Why? Because you've used the, the, the word of God as a, as a sword. And God wants us to do that. God wants us to use the sword. When we're smart, we do that. And we come before the Lord and we say, God, you said. <laughs> Man, I, <laughs> I hate it when my kids do that. But Daddy, you said. And I think, oh, why did I say that? There was a moment of weakness. It was a moment of insanity. You know, uh, are you sure? Daddy, you said. I don't know about you, but I've got to back that. I've got to. As much as I think, oh man, then I don't ever do that again. Think before you say something. I've got to back that. Can I tell you, our God backs His Word even more than we do as earthly fathers. When you and I come and we say, but Daddy, Father God, you said, you said, He's got to back that. Because you see, Numbers chapter 23 says that He is not a God that He should lie, nor a son of man, in other words, a human being that he should change his mind. So when, when you and I come before him, God, God, you see, when he says something, he sticks to it. When he makes a promise, he goes through with it. When, 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 God, when, when God gives us his word, he, he honors that. And so when you and I come and we say, we say God, you said, <laughs> the king roars on our behalf. And, and the enemies have got to scatter when, when that happens. Now, the Bible says that the tongue has the power of life and death. Proverbs chapter 18. And so whatever you and I speak will have consequences. There'll be fruit of what we say. Now, the Bible tells us in Joshua 1 verse 8. I want to go back to that verse. It says, do not let this book of the law... Depart from your, from your mouth. From your mouth. It says there's power in this. He says you've got to dig into it. And you've got to discover. And if you're really smart, start doing it. Because then you'll be blessed and prosperous and successful. He said, but most of all, he says, don't let the, the, these, these words depart from your mouth. You've got to start speaking it. Why? Because that's when the king roars on your behalf. I, I want to say it again to you, Maranatha. There is a king that wants to roar on your behalf, but he's waiting for you to quote the scripture. He's waiting for you to use his, his very words. Why do you think Jesus used scripture? In the wilderness, when Satan came to, to, to uh, uh, tempt him, what did he do? Did he argue with Satan? Did he try and get smart? <laughs> no. He simply quoted scripture. It is written. Now let me say to you, if Jesus needed to quote Scripture with all the power and all the authority that He had, He could raise people from the dead, heal the blind. If Jesus had to quote Scripture, come on, who do we think we are? That we can just walk around casual, naked, the helmet of salvation on. I'm saved. And Paul says, use it. You don't realize what you have in the sword. Start using. You drive back the enemy off of your finances, off of your, 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 your business, off of your family, off of your relationship, off of your health. Drive the enemy back. Paul saying to us, use it. If Jesus needed to, he says, then, then you need to do it as well. Why? Because God backs his word. God backs his word. Listen, let me give you two scriptures quickly. Psalm 89, I will not break my covenant. I will not take back a single word I said. 2 Corinthians 1.20, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. He backs His word. And His word is powerful. Now, listen, Scripture tells us to use 
Our weapon, our weapon is the sword. Now listen to this. He says, the weapons we fight with, 2 Corinthians 10, the weapons we fight with, in other words, the sword, are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power. In other words, it's saying, man, you have supernatural power available to you in the sword, in the roar of the king. Start using it. Start using it. And this is why memorizing Scripture is so important. And this is why, why, why I keep on encouraging you, even if it's one scripture a week. Come on. We've got to memorize scripture. If you don't have scripture in your heart, you can't declare it. You, 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 got, you got nothing. But when it's on the inside and you start declaring scripture, it's like little Simba. He, he comes and as, as, he, as he wants to roar, there's this powerful loud roar behind him and that's exactly what happens when you and i start declaring scripture some people have been declaring the wrong thing oh, i'll never be able to I'll, I, 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 I won't be able to afford this I, I, I won't be able to get out of debt i can't see how you know my, my child they will never you know I, I don't know how and so they they keep on saying those things do you know it's just as easy to declare positive things as it is negative stuff? Then why? Why do we keep on saying negative things, speaking negative things over ourselves, over our country and, and stuff like that? It's, beca it's because it's become a bad habit. I'm saying, Maranatha, we better change this habit if we want to see things change. We've got to start declaring God's word if we want Him to, to roar on, on our behalf. You see, there is a huge difference, and I want to leave this last thought quickly with you this morning, and then we're done. There's a huge difference between knowing something about a promise and knowing the promise. The one is Logos. I know something about it. It's there somewhere. The other one is Rhema. It's my promise. When, when I know something about the promise, when it's just Logos, God, you say something about, I'll be blessed when I tithe, I think. When I know the promise, I say, God, you say, if I bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, in other words, the church, it's, it doesn't even belong to me. I, I'm not paying it. I'm just giving it. I'm just returning it to you. You say, if I bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, you will open the floodgates of heaven, and I will not have room enough to contain it. God, you say, guess what happens? The king roars on your behalf. And if you, when you turn and look back, Poverty is busy running out the back of the cave because the king is roaring on your behalf. You see the difference between knowing something about the promise somewhere and standing up with a boldness and a confidence. And you say, Daddy, you said it. And when you and I come with simple, childlike faith and a confidence where we just say, Daddy, you said, and I'm standing on that. Guess what happens? God moves on our behalf, and the enemy has got to scatter. Let's stand. I want to pray for us. Father, your word here is full of promises, loaded with more than 2,000 promises for me, for every single one of us here. I pray, Lord, that we will take hold of these, that we'll start digging in, we'll start looking with eyes to discover, not just to scan through chapters but we'll start digging in in order to discover. 
And as we discover, Lord, that we may use your precious word, your powerful word, that you may roar on our behalf. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you.